If you're like most researchers in the biological sciences, to this point in your career, you've lived pretty contentedly doing everything off of the computer that's sitting on your desk. You've done things like email, you're on the internet, heck, you're watching this video on your browser, right? Uh, perhaps you're using Microsoft Word or something like that to do your word processing using Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. So again, do some number crunching, perhaps something a little more sophisticated might be using GraphPad Prism, or hopefully I've convinced you to start using R. Um, but again, at some point, uh, you're going to need to mature your skills a little bit more. You're going to have more data. Um, right now, I guarantee that most people in biology have too much data for their own good. So if you project ahead another 5, 10 years, do you think we're going to have more data or less data? I'll give you a second to think about that. Yeah, of course, you're going to have more data, right? And so you're going to need more sophisticated tools to work with that data. Now, all those tools I mentioned are very sophisticated, and they've really adapted to kind of the changes in computer technology and our needs. That being said, uh, the software and the hardware that we are using uh, to do all these things are designed for the general population. They're not necessarily designed for biologists. And so perhaps to this point, maybe a couple of years ago, um, that served us very well. But what you've perhaps noticed is that we are now in an era of big data in biology, right? We have massively high throughput sequencing, um, people doing genomics, amplicon sequencing, metatranscriptomics, immunologists even <laughs> are doing flow cytometry, they're doing Luminex assays, uh, metabolomics has the potential to also generate large, large, large data sets. Um, colleagues that do a lot of image analysis are generating massive files of pictures and images that they're trying to process with their computers. We're not gonna be able to analyze that on our local computer. That calls for some heavier hardware and a topic that I'm gonna to introduce to you today, if you haven't heard it already, of a high performance computer, also called an HPC. As you may know, my lab spends a lot of time and energy developing a software package called Mother that's widely used in the microbiome field. As part of that, I do a lot of instructional presentations to teach people how to use Mother. And so as people are getting ready to take those workshops or if they're just getting into microbiome analysis in general, they email me and they say, hey, Pat, what kind of computer should I get? This is what I currently have. This is the type of data I have. And I always feel really uncomfortable answering that question because it's like I'm trying to spend their money. And I do not want to spend anyone else's money and I really don't want to spend my own money. And so that's a hard problem because the data sets are going to evolve with time. You might want to buy a computer that you can use for a long period of time. You probably want to use your computer for other things, right? So a lot of the analyses we do uh, might take hours or maybe even days to run. And so that's going to kind of tie up your computer so you can't do things like, you know, watch Netflix. <laughs> um, and so questions that come up would be things like how much RAM, how many CPUs, how big of a hard drive, right? And so these are all um, features of computers that are constantly evolving. If you buy a computer today, by the time it shows up, it's gonna be obsolete, right? And so asking me what you should get, you know, I'm gonna say, well, get the biggest, baddest computer you can get. That's not a really good answer. The alternative, as I've mentioned already, is a high performance computer, an HPC. Now, there's two general approaches to HPCs. Now, many of us have an HPC at our home institution. The University of Michigan has one called Great Lakes. Um, it previously had one called Flux, but Great Lakes is a massive computer made up of hundreds of smaller computers. Also at the University of Michigan, we have standard nodes or standard processors that we can run things on where maybe we get six or seven gigabytes per processor. But we also have high memory nodes where we can get perhaps 100 gigabytes or so of RAM per processor for jobs that require a lot of oomph, you know, for things like genome assembly, perhaps, uh, something that we have found sometimes requires a lot of uh, memory. But again, the value of an HPC is that I can run a job on that high memory processor um, for a short period of time without having to buy the computer myself, and then I can put everything back on a lower memory uh, set of processors, again, making life cheap, and it's all done in a very seamless and easy way. Another approach is to use Amazon Web Services, AWS, where you can buy computing resources on Amazon servers and do your processing there. 
both options are very cheap, and in fact, far cheaper than buying a dedicated machine. About 12 years ago, when I joined the University of Michigan, I spent a lot of my startup funds to buy computers that were mine and that no one else could use. Um, and so I just loved knowing that I had my own resources that if I had to, I could go find and point to and say, those are my computers, no one else can use them. And as the high performance computing resources at Michigan got ramped up, they were always saying, hey, Pat, why don't you join Great Lakes? Why don't you join Flux, whatever it was at the time? And I was like, no, no, I want my own thing. I don't want other people touching my computers, which is kind of a really stupid <laughs> mindset. And so finally I asked the guy, you know, I use these computers a lot, I think. <laughs> Can you tell me what percent of the computes of, you know, the time this computer is on, am I actually using it? And what they told me totally surprised me. We were only using about 10% of the computer. And so if the computer was on for 24 hours, in any average day, we would be using it for 2.4 hours, right? And that'd be because there's days that we're not using it, days that we're using it heavily. But on average, over a month, over the years, we used it for 10% of the time. And so what that means is that if the computer was $10,000, that I was effectively paying $100,000 for that computer because we just weren't using it. The high performance computer and Amazon like it means that I can pay to use a CPU by a unit time. And so this is the motivation for a high performance computer like Great Lakes at Michigan or Amazon Web Services is that we take a whole bunch of people that perhaps need 10% of a computer and you know you get 10 people together and they can use one computer, right? Well, across Michigan, there might be hundreds of researchers and for Amazon, there might be thousands of people um, that are all using different parts of their computer resources, making it cheaper for everybody. Besides the saved costs on the computes, I can also save the costs on my laptop or on whatever computer it is that I'm using. I don't have to get the latest, greatest laptop for performance to run Mother, to run R, to run all these other processes. Um, I would need a computer that serves my recreational needs, perhaps that serves my word processing or email or whatever, right? Things that aren't so compute heavy and don't have such high requirements because I'm using that computer to log into the high performance computer, right? So I could get a Chromebook and I could log into my HPC. Heck, I've used my iPhone to run mother um, off my phone, <laughs> which is kind of trippy and really not very convenient. But anyway, you get the idea, right? That the computer I'm using now is a terminal to log into the HPC. And so I can save costs on my local computer. Now, again, if you're a gamer and you want like a totally tricked out computer, that's cool. But you don't have to get a tricked out computer to do bioinformatics. You can buy into a tricked out computer that is really cheap um, and very affordable and convenient to use. The challenge though, is that while it's convenient to use and the resources are available, it's not necessarily easy to use and it's not necessarily um, something that is super intuitive. And so today I'm gonna solve one of the challenges with using a high performance computer that you might find at your local institution. For now, I'm going to ignore Amazon Web Services, but know that that is a totally viable option that's also very affordable. If you're interested in learning more about that, definitely leave me a comment down below and I'll see what I can do about putting together a, a parallel episode to this one using Amazon Web Services. Now, one of the challenges about teaching how to use a high performance computer is that every institution's HPCs is going to vary wildly. Things like how do you get an account? How do you log in? How do you install software? These types of mundane things are variable across different institutions. And while there might be some commonalities, eh, I'll leave that to your own local um, systems administrators and educators to teach you how to do those tasks. One of the things that's very common though across all HPCs is that they generally all use some type of resource allocation management software. University of Michigan uses one called Slurm. Previously, we used one called Torque. Um, let me know down below what your institution uses. Are you using Torque or are you using Slurm like the University of Michigan? What are these resource allocation tools? They're also called workload managers. Um, so what they do is they allow you to get access to different parts of the computer, of this massive high performance computer. And so you're probably asking, what do you mean? I can't just like fire off and run a command um, at will? No. <laughs> um, so first of all, one thing to note is that they are typically going to be uh, command line interfaces. And while sometimes there are graphical interfaces, 
I'd say 95% of the time, it's going to be a command line interface. So you need to learn the command line, right? So that's one more thing to learn, and that's a challenge. The other thing is that if we have 100 researchers that wanna use this resource, we don't want them all kind of going at that resource at once, right? So if there's 100 processors, we don't want them all kind of fighting <laughs> for those 100 processors. We need these workload management tools like Slurm uh, to say, well, you know, you need this much of a resource and you need that much of a resource. And so we're going to allocate the resources to you so that we can get the most jobs done in the quickest amount of time and also prioritizing people that came first. Again, the people that manage the HPCs can alter who gets priority and who doesn't. Again, the idea of a workload management software tool like Slurm is that I can tell it for this program that I'm trying to run, how much RAM do I need, how many processors do I need, and how much time do I need to execute that. Now, I don't know exactly how much RAM or how much time I'm gonna need to run it. I'm gonna set a ceiling on uh, how the, my, the resources that I require. Then what Slurm does is it looks at the jobs I'm trying to run, those scripts are called jobs. So it looks at those jobs and their requirements, and it looks at my friend Evan's jobs and my other friend Jenna's jobs, and it kind of looks at all the different requirements and figures out the best way to allocate those jobs to the resources that are available. Now, every institution is different in how they manage their HPC. Um, they have different rules on how to establish priority. They have different rules on the maximum time you can request or the number of processors you can request or the amount of RAM you can request. So like at the University of Michigan, the longest time that I can run a job for is two weeks. And you might be thinking, oh my gosh, two weeks, that's forever. Well, I've had jobs in the past that I needed to run actually for a month. <laughs> and so in those cases, you kind of need to work with the systems administrators of your HPC to figure out a solution. Again, the rules for establishing priority and the ceilings on the different resources you can request are all gonna vary by institution and who's running the high performance computer that you're trying to get access to, but they're all basically the same kind of idea, right? The same concepts that we have this tool, you know, Slurm or Torque, and they help us to get our jobs onto the processors, onto the computer in a fairly equitable way. Um, that keeps in mind kind of the resources that are needed and the resources that are available. In the remainder of this episode, I wanna share with you the three approaches that my lab uses to run jobs on the, our HPC. So the first is an interactive mode where I'm directly entering the commands at the console and it then runs them um, on these compute resources. You might be thinking, isn't that the way we always do it? Hold on. <laughs> a second approach is a batch mode where I tell it the command to run and then I go away and come back when it's done. A third approach is also a batch mode, but it's a batch mode that I can create an array. So I submit the job, but it then does a hundred things or a thousand things all at the same time, each time with a different set of parameters. So we'll call that an array job. So let's head over to my terminal where I'm already logged into Great Lakes. So I can show you these three different ways that I would run Slurm using the code that I've already made for my Microbe ML demo. So the first approach is an interactive mode. So again, you might be thinking interactive, like don't we always run things from the command line? Yes, <laughs> but in this case, we're going to use the interactive mode to launch a job on what we'll call the compute nodes. Right now, I am currently on the head node of my computer. So this is the node that I logged into. This is the computer that I'm logging into. And so Slurm then takes my job from the head node and distributes then to those compute nodes. The interactive mode allows me to interact directly on that compute node without having to submit a job that I kind of walk away from. We might walk away from it, but we'll be able to enter it in real time. So I have a script in here already called interactive.slurm. So let me use cat to show you what this looks like. So this is cat interactive slurm. I have a command called s run. I give it my account name, which is account equals pschloss1, uh, the partition I'm on, uh, the amount of time I need, which is, um, I believe this is two hours, the number of tasks, one task, uh, CPUs per task, one, uh, nodes, I'm using one node, so there's multiple CPUs per node, and I'm requesting six gigabytes of RAM, which is probably far more than I actually need. And then it gets kind of wrapped around the screen here, but then I do this dash dash PTY forward slash bin bash that basically tells Slurm to fire up bash, this command line environment 
on that compute node. Now, that's a lot to remember to type in every time. So I make this script, interactive slurm. I put a shebang line at the top of it so I can then execute it. And I have typed this in once <laughs> and I then move this script from project to project so that it's good to use um, in all those different cases. I also, um, if I do an L LSLTH on my directory, you will see that my interactive slurm is executable, right? So I can do a period forward slash interactive slurm and it puts my work now in the queue and it's getting ready to fire off those resources. It maybe took 20 seconds to find the resources and then put me on that queue. Now, I it looks like I'm at the head node still, but I'm really logged into uh, one of the compute nodes. And you can see that I went from being on GL login two, which is a login node, to being in GL3062, which is a compute node. So again, from here now I can do R to go into R. Um, I could you know, do two plus two uh, to get my numbers of four. I could also source um, code that I've developed before. So code forward slash uh, genus uh, by genus analysis dot R. I can run that and I can look at the output that comes to the screen as it runs through uh, that R script. This is an interactive mode where again, in real time, I can enter commands into a program like R but without sucking up the valuable resources on the head node, uh, which people are trying to use to be able to fire off their jobs to these compute nodes. So again, we're on the compute nodes um, and it's asking um, if I want to in include something. So I'll go ahead and say yes, um, and it'll install that and I'll move forward. So again, I'm in the interactive mode. And so to quit out of R, R I would do Q and I'm still on the compute node. And so to get out of that interactive mode, I'll again type exit to quit out of the compute node and come back now to my login node. So again, that's the interactive mode. Um, I will go ahead and be sure to put interactive.slurm in the repository. So if you click the description down below, that will take you um, to a blog post associated with today's episode, which will then show you how you can get um, this interactive.slurm and all the other slurm scripts that I'm gonna be showing you in today's episode. The second approach that I wanna show you is how to submit a batch job. Uh, in this version of a batch job, I'm gonna show you how to submit a single command um, or a set of commands that you would run in series. So in this script, I have, um, again, at the top is the shebang line to run this script. It's got a series of S batch commands. Again, they start with a pound sign. Normally that might mean a comment. In this case, it's telling Slurm what to do. And so there is a series of maybe 10 or 12 lines here with instructions to Slurm on how to run the job. So the first is my email address. So before I post this, I'm gonna remove that email address because I don't wanna get emails about your jobs. Um, but this will then be the way that you get notified of when your job starts and when it finishes. It'll send you an email. So here it says beginning and end. And if you just want it at the end, you would remove the begin. If you just want it at the beginning, you'd remove the end. Anyway, um, you can then say your resources, right? So how many CPUs do you want per task? Here I only want one. Um, actually, I'm gonna change this. So I'm going to ask for 16 CPUs. Um, and that way I can put 16 seeds on each of 16 different processors, um, much like the way we ran it on my laptop, but again, doing it up on Great Lakes. Um, we'll use one node, one task per node, probably four gigabytes per CPU is fine. Previously, uh, when we did the interactive mode, I think we used six. I'm asking for 24 hours. I'll go ahead and just make it two hours. Pshloss one is my labs account that we all uh, get access to. We're on a standard partition. And then this is some text to uh, format the name of the output file. So things like the account and the partition, again, those are things that your um, systems administrators are going to have to tell you uh, what to enter. Now for the command, I'm gonna go ahead and do make processed data forward slash L2 genus pooled performance dot TSV. And so that is the command that I want Slurm to run for me. Again, to get it to use all 16 processors, I need to do make hyphen J 16. And so then that'll take uh, the dependencies that are required to build this L2 genus pooled performance.tse file. Um, there's a hundred dependencies, right? And so this is saying use 16 processors to do that. So I'll go ahead and save that. And then I'll quit out of nano. To run this, I can then do sbatch and I can then do single 
Slurm. Normally I might give it a more descriptive title so I know what's going on. I can go ahead and run that, it's submitted. I can now look to see what's going on in the queue. So I can say sque hyphen p schloss, which is my account name. Oh, sorry, that should be sque u p schloss. And so it says, this is my job ID. Uh, it's on a standard partition. This is the name of the file, the user, the account, how long it's been running for, 14 seconds. So it fired off pretty quickly and it's up and running. Um, I can do something like lslth uh, data, uh, process data. So it looks like it's running, but it hasn't outputted anything yet because again, it takes 90 seconds or so um, for, the for each job to complete. If I do an ls, I see that I've got single.slurm.o um, and a bunch of <laughs> numbers. Uh, this is the job ID, right? So I can do a nano on single slurm.o, um, tab completion to the rescue. Um, and I can now see everything that's being outputted to the screen and that it's fired off those first 16 jobs. Um, this gets pretty messy, pretty gnarly. Um, so I'll chill out and let it run. It should just take a couple minutes to run and we'll see what happens. So I got both my beginning email about 12 minutes ago <laughs> and my completed email um, from the Slurm system. And as you'll see, it says ended runtime 11 minutes, 36 seconds, completed exit code zero, which means everything was good. If I do an ls hyphen LTH on my process data directory, I see all those um, intermediate files, the, the dependencies for building the pooled performance and the pooled HP file. Um, again, this all looks really good. And we have all 100 of our L2 genus, whatever the seed was for the random number generators RDS files. And that worked well. So again, that was how we created a batch job uh, for a single uh, command to be run. Now, um, we could do multiple lines here, right? We could enter beyond this, just this make one. We could put in other make rules or other commands that we might want to run after that. And those would all be run in series. Something you might think about was, well, maybe instead of doing 16 processors, let's do 100 processors. And that way then we can put each of those random seeds on its own processor. And then that way it would be done in like 90 seconds because each 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 iteration, each seed should only take about 90 seconds or so. So that's what we're gonna do with an array job. So again, if we look at nano array.slurm, so we see that array.slurm looks very similar to that single.slurm script that I used previously. We have all the same sbatch commands setting up the resources that we need. Um, and what you'll see down here, the last line in this set of commands is array one to 10. And so what this says is create an array basically 100 different jobs, one to 10. I actually want 100, so I'm gonna change that to be one to 100. And the array value for that particular job, so we'll submit this like we did with the single uh, dot slurm, and it will then instantly spawn 100 different jobs. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and so it keeps track of which array value it is, which job is it in that array of 100. And that is stored in this variable slurm array task ID. And so we write it with a dollar sign and then a pair of parentheses. And we can then echo the seed to each of the individual output files that we have. And so what I can do is I can say make processed data forward slash L2 genus underscore and then dollar sign seed dot RDS. Okay, so that is the rule that I want each of those spawned jobs to run. Right, and so where it says dollar sign seed, it's gonna plug in a value from one to 100 and fire those all off and that will be then good. And then we'll come back and we can run again that single dot slurm file uh, script that we ran to kind of pull them all together and pull the values. I'm gonna go ahead and save this. And I also need to remove all of these older RDS files that I just created because the current, um, if I ran them now with make, um, it, it wouldn't run make because these files are already up to date. So I'll go ahead and do rm process data um, l2 star. And I'm looking at the contents. It's empty. We're good to go. So again, I'll do sbatch array.slurm. Cross our fingers that everything works and away we go. I can also then do sque hyphen u p schloss. 
and I see that that is loaded up and it's getting ready to go, you'll see that it's got a job ID and then in the square brackets, one to 100. So now if I look at that output again, I see that I have 20 um, other sub jobs run, running at the same time. Again, it says there's 20 openings. We'll go ahead and plug those jobs in for you, Pat. Um, and I can kind of <laughs> neurotically click on these periodically and see how long it takes to get all the jobs loaded. And I think I probably have all 100 of my jobs running currently, and it should just be a minute or two before they're all done. So that all ran and went pretty well. Uh, it took about two minutes to run for all of those things to find uh, resources to use and then run those seeds on the 100 uh, different processors. So very quick, very efficient. Um, not that it was that so long earlier, but again, um, you can imagine with a much larger job with like say Random Forest where things might take a few hours to run, being able to run um, 100 of those jobs all in parallel at the same time will really speed things up versus having to put some things in series. All right, so we've got those um, 100 RDS scripts created. Let's go ahead and double check that. We'll do process data, and we see the 100 um, RDS scripts for the L2 genus for those 100 seeds. And I can then go ahead and rerun my single S batch at slurm file. So I'll do S batch, single slurm. We'll run that. Uh, that's submitted. Uh, we can do look at the queue to double check everything is good. It should just take a moment or two and then we'll be good to go. Again, the job completed, compiling all those 100 seeds together. Um, I can do ls lth on my process data to see those 100 seeds as well as uh, the genus pooled uh, performance and hp.tsv files. Uh, we could then use this for doing our visualizations and downstream steps. But again, what I wanted to emphasize in this episode is how we can use uh, this resource allocation management tool, Slurm, uh, to run an uh, interactive job, a single batch command, and then an array batch command. Uh, Torque has all the same features, but slightly different context. Um, I would encourage you, again, to talk with the people running your system, um, their system administrators for your high-performance computer, uh, to kind of see how you might translate between Slurm and Torque. I would do an episode on Torque, but we no longer have access to Torque. I think Slurm is a bit more popular anyway, but anyway, definitely be in touch with the systems administrators of your system. A final thing that I wanna do is clean up. And so one of the downsides of Slurm and Torque is that you get all these output files that I really don't care about, right? So I could you know, look at one of these and do nano on that file, and I could kind of scan through here and see that it's all the same kind of messages that we saw when we are running it in our studio directly. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete those files. So to do that, I'll do rm array slurm dot o, um, and so I'll do, put in a star to remove all those, and I'll also do remove single slurm uh, dot o, and then that start of the tag. And so now um, I have a clean uh, project root directory, and we're good to go for the next step in our project. So again, if you wanna get my slurm scripts, be sure to check the link down below in the description that will take you to a blog post showing you uh, where you can get those Slurm files. Uh, does this convince you the value of working on a high performance computer? Frankly, at some point, you're not gonna really have a choice because you're gonna have so much data or your analysis is gonna be so complicated that you don't really have a choice um, but to move to a high performance computer. Maybe your institution doesn't have a high performance computer. And in that case, I'd strongly encourage you to try to use Amazon Web Services. Um, please let me know down below in the comments whether or not you would like to see a similar uh, type of episode that I've done here, but doing it for AWS. Let me know and I'll see what I can work out. Keep practicing with this. Try to use this with your own project. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.